Hello students and welcome back to Political Science 1513 American Federal Government Online. As always, I am your instructor Connor Alford and in this video we're going to begin to talk about one of my absolute favorite topics, the Constitution of the United States, one of the most influential and important documents in human history and the history of human development, a monumental piece of political philosophy that has forever changed the world in which we live, not just for our country, but for literally every country on the face of the globe. So we'll talk about the Constitution of the United States, we'll talk a little bit about its historical origins and inspirations, we'll talk about its key components, its core ideas, and its central principles. Towards this end, we have a series of four learning objectives, each of which I want you to understand is going to encompass quite a lot of information. So the first learning objective asks for you to explain what a constitution is in general terms, and then we're going to narrow our scope, and to continue that first, learning objective, you'll need to be able to explain where our Constitution came from and how it was produced. Then we're going to move into learning objective two, where you are asked to delineate and describe each of the seven core principles of the United States Constitution. And then finally, we will close by delineating and describing the importance of the key components of the United States Constitution as a document. And those key components are the preamble, the seven articles, and the amendments. And we're going to find that I will divide the seven articles and the amendments into separate categories or subgroups. So for instance, in the amendments, we're going to focus in particular on the first 10 amendments, which are called the Bill of Rights, and we're going to focus on what are called the Civil War amendments. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. To start with, let's start with that first learning objective where again you're asked to talk about what constitutions are in general terms and then narrow the scope to look at our constitution, where it came from and how it was produced. A constitution might be defined as a usually written system of fundamental principles determining the powers, duties, and operational procedures of a governing body. Alternatively, you might just define a constitution as a plan or charter of government. However you define the term, however, there are two key points that you need to pay careful attention to. Number one, a constitution creates a system of rules for the rule makers. In other words, the constitution tells lawmakers what procedures they need to go through to create laws and exercise their authority as legislators. It tells people in positions of power how they can and cannot use that power, what they must and must not do, and what conditions they have to satisfy in order to retain power. In addition to creating rules for the rule makers governing the government, constitutions create a charter or a framework of government. In other words, they describe the institutional structure of government. For instance, our Constitution tells us that our federal government will be divided into three separate branches. And then Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution proceed to describe each of these three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial respectively, one by one. They talk about what they will look like, how they will operate, what they can and cannot do, so on and so forth. So the bottom line is that in general terms, a constitution is simply a system of rules for the rule makers and a description of the institutional structure or framework with which a government will operate. And that's all good and well, but let's narrow the scope and look at our constitution in particular, because you're going to find that our constitution is somewhat unique and is especially important among all the world's constitutions. And no, I don't just say that because it is in fact our constitution. Historically, this was a revolutionary idea. Indeed, what we're going to discover is that the United States Constitution is the oldest living constitution of any country in the world today. So understanding it plays a critical role into understanding not just our government and how it operates, but understanding the culmination of Western history, political thought, and philosophy. Let's begin by talking about the origins, historically, of the United States Constitution. We've already delved quite deeply into the historical origins of our constitutional system of government in prior lectures, but I want to refresh your memory just a little bit. So remember that our Constitution is a product of its unique historical setting. The Constitution was written shortly after the American Revolution. 
At this point in our history, we had experienced very strong centralized imperial government as British colonists, and we didn't like it. Then we experienced very weak federal government under the Articles of Confederation, and although those articles did get us through the Revolutionary War, they began to run into problems with events like Shays' Rebellion shortly thereafter. So we didn't like that either. Therefore, we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. The Constitution of the United States creates a federal government which is much stronger than what we saw under the Articles of Confederation, but, is, but that is much more limited than what we experienced as British subjects during the colonial period in our history. So these experiences that we've already talked about during, after, and before the American Revolutionary War are all going to play an important role. But intellectually, it's important to recognize that the American Revolution was not just an armed conflict. There is a distinction between the American Revolution, on the one hand, the American Revolutionary War, on the other hand. To help make this distinction clear, you might instead call the American Revolutionary War the American War for Independence. So what's the difference between the American Revolution and the American Revolutionary War or War for Independence? Well, I want you to understand that the American Revolution took place before the first shots were ever fired in the minds of the people. In other words, the American Revolution was fundamentally an intellectual revolution, a revolution in the values that people held and the beliefs and expectations that they had for their governments. We talked about these core values of independence, limited government, representation, individual liberties, so on and so forth in our last lecture. But the development of these values was the real American Revolution. The American Revolutionary War was just the manifestation of a system that we came to value and hold as sacred as a result of these changes in human thought. Our Constitution embodies, personifies, and codifies those core values, beliefs, principles, and concepts into law and uses them to create a more just, a more perfect union under which to govern human affairs in our country. So now that we know where it comes from in a historical and intellectual sense, let's talk a little bit about how it was produced. Now again, this is going to be brief because we've already discussed the Constitutional Convention. But what I want you to jot down in your notes is that the United States Constitution is, at the end of the day, a negotiated document. Remember that it was a product of controversy and compromise. What this means is that at the Constitutional Convention, the delegates that met to write and frame our new charter of government had very different ideas about what that charter should say and how that government should operate. And they didn't always see eye to eye. Sometimes it was very difficult for them to resolve their competing ideas about how best to secure human liberty and flourishing how best to structure and model our government. Therefore, in order to get anything done, there had to be just a little bit of give and take. As a result, what we're going to find is that none of the framers, none of the delegates at the Constitutional Convention walked away completely satisfied with the Constitution. All of them were upset about something that got left out or that got added in. But at the end of the day, the product that they produced was something that was acceptable to all parties. Nobody got everything they wanted, but everybody got enough that they were willing to attach their names to that sacred document. So here we get the Constitution of the United States as a product of controversy and compromise, i.e. a negotiated document. Now, the Constitution was also a revolutionary document in a couple of ways. Number one, it was trying out some new ideas that had never been put into practice in European experience, like, for instance, the separation of powers. Now, I do want to emphasize that these had never been tried out in the European experience. Things like the separation of powers had been tried out by some Native American federations or confederacies like the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee. They'd been trying these things for a long time before white people ever stepped foot on the North American continent. But in the European experience, these ideas had, until the Constitution, been just that 
ideas, things that people had talked about which sounded great in theory, but which people weren't sure would actually work out. And so what we're going to find is that by putting these into practice, our Constitution started an experiment that has culminated in the country we have today. Now, I'll let you decide how successful the results of this experiment were. But at the end of the day, the ideas were new to those who were trying them, and in this sense, the Constitution is revolutionary. The second way in which the Constitution of the United States was revolutionary was in that it created a new system of government that hadn't been there before. The government we live under today is structured by the Constitution, and therefore it looks totally different than what we had prior to that point under the Articles of Confederation. Now, while it is true to say that our Constitution is revolutionary, I also want to caution you about taking this to the extremes. Because while it was revolutionary, it was moderately revolutionary. The American Revolution itself was a moderate revolution. It was based on ideas popularized in Europe by British Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke and American thinkers during the first Great Awakening like Winthrop. But one thing we're going to find about these thinkers is that especially when we're looking at the British Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke, they were much less radical, much less violent and vociferous in their dispositions than were the Enlightenment thinkers in continental Europe. So if you compare the American Revolution to, for instance, the French Revolution, you're going to find that it was actually a comparatively humane, peaceful, and orderly transition. The European Revolutionary War was a reign of terror that tore down an entire system of government and replaced it with something that was very and drastically different, at least for a while. Then they get a new dictator in Napoleon, but we can push that aside. The point here is that if you look at our Constitution and the changes it brought forth, they're comparatively modest. It did not, for instance, take any steps to strip the people in positions of power and privilege of their property or take their power away and put it in the hands of the masses in any kind of a massive or immediately obvious way. It did give the masses a voice in government, but it did not do so to such an extent that we had to tear down or strike down the people of the propertied classes. So in these ways, our Constitution is a negotiated and moderate revolutionary document. But it's also a historical document. As I've told you, in order to fully understand it, you need to be familiar with the history. You need to understand the Enlightenment ideas and principles of folks like John Locke. And you need to understand the First Great Awakening. So what was the European Enlightenment? Well, by and large, the European Enlightenment was an epistemological revolution in Europe. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy dealing with how people learn about the world. And what we will find is that this epistemological revolution was a transition where people in Europe began to change how they thought about learning. They began to believe in empiricism and reason. How do we learn about the world? By observing it with our senses and then using sound logic to draw conclusions and deductions from these verifiable observations. So in Enlightenment thought, things need to be well justified using logic and reason. So if you are going to look at the preamble of the Constitution, if you're going to look at the Declaration of Independence, you're going to find that they kind of make arguments. They don't just make assertions and then justify them by reference to, say, God's will or a religious tome. They make arguments. In the Declaration of Independence, for example, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote that document, tells us that the fight for independence is justified due to a long train of abuses and usurpations against our American revolutionary values and systems by the British monarchy. And so again, we're seeing this idea that you need to be able to rationalize and justify what you're doing, and you need to be realistic. Your ideas should be based not on some utopian ideal or religious promise, 
but upon a reasoned assessment of what is feasible given the realities of human experience and individual human natures. So that's important. Not quite as important, but still very substantial, is the First Great Awakening, which was a religious revival that took place throughout the entire English-speaking world in the 1730s and 40s leading up to the French and Indian War. Now again, this did take place in the entire English-speaking world, but the First Great Awakening was especially important in the North American colonies. Benjamin Franklin has some really fun quotes about how during this period people became so religious you couldn't walk down the street without hearing a hymn. And there are a couple of important things about the First Great Awakening that feature in our Constitution. So I could tell you a lot, but here's what I want you to focus on. During the First Great Awakening, there was a transition in Christian thought to place a greater degree of emphasis on individual experience and God-given rights. Now, this idea that rights come from God, not government, is important in limiting the activities of government, in telling government what it cannot do or take away from individuals under its authority. And they are individual rights, which again is a product of this awakening telling us to focus on particular persons and not just corporate structures or communities. So the Enlightenment gives us reason, it gives us a belief that government should be based on the practical realities of human nature rather than religious ideals or utopian dreams, and the Awakening gives us an emphasis on the individual's experience and God-given rights. Combine these with those colonial revolutionary and post-revolutionary experiences already covered in last week's lecture, and you kind of get an understanding of why our Constitution says what it says and doesn't say what it doesn't say. But what does our Constitution say? Well, to answer this, let's move on to our second learning objective, where you're asked to delineate and describe each of the seven core principles of the United States Constitution. The seven core principles of the United States Constitution are as follows. Number one, the social contract. Number two, the rule of law. Number three, republicanism. Number four, federalism. Number five, the separation of powers. Number six, checks and balances. Number seven, limited government. And as a part of that, individual liberties. So let's look at each of these one by one. And I'm going to try to provide you with some quotes from some of the framers and founding fathers to help illustrate the sort of spirit and fervor with which these principles were held. Let's begin then with the social contract. Remember from prior lecture, a social contract is an implicit or explicit agreement among the members of a society to cooperate under some centralized authority in exchange for the social benefits that that centralized authority provides to them. So social contract theory stipulates a couple of important things that are going to manifest themselves in our Constitution. Number one, legitimate government is government by the consent of the governed. Why do we have to obey the rules that the government creates? Well, because we agreed to do so in exchange for the benefits that the government provides. And we're going to express this consent or withdraw this consent to be governed by any particular group of decision makers through our elections. So part of the social contract is representation. And what we're going to find is that if the government derives its authority over us from our consent, then we have the ability to replace that government when we're no longer satisfied with it. Because the funny thing about consent is that it can be withdrawn. Consent can also be conditional. And as that definition of the social contract tells us, we are consenting to follow the government's orders in exchange for social benefits, things like law and order security, and the protection of our individual liberties from force and fraud, either at home by criminals or abroad by foreign powers. And therefore, what we're going to find is that if the government is no longer fulfilling its end of the obligation, we don't have any responsibility to obey its edicts. In other words, if the government's no longer serving the good of the people, it's illegitimate. So the social contract idea or theory again tells us that government derives its authority from the consent of the governed, usually expressed through participation in elections, and that government must serve certain limited goods defined by those people and from which the governed will benefit. So it's government by and for the people. And the quote that I've grabbed 
is, in this case, from Thomas Jefferson. And in particular, it's from that Declaration of Independence. Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The very first words of the United States Constitution are, we the people. It doesn't say we the delegates of the states. That's the language that we had under the Articles of Confederation. It says we the people. So where does the government derive its legitimacy? What makes the Constitution binding law? We the people. We hold power. Sometimes people will refer to this as popular sovereignty, although that can be confused with other ideas like those articulated by a later thinker in the French Revolution, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and the individuals who wanted to justify slavery in individual states, also called their movement popular sovereignty. So we need to be careful using that language. I prefer the language of social contract, but understand that if you had this class from another instructor, instead of saying that the first principle is the social contract, they might say that the first principle is popular sovereignty. Let's go ahead and move on to the second of our seven core principles. This one is related to the first. It is the rule of law. The rule of law principle is the principle that all people and institutions, including our government and government decision makers, are subject to the law and prohibited from arbitrarily exercising power. Our Constitution, remember, is a system of rules for the rule makers. It tells the people in power how they can go about creating laws and what those laws can and cannot do for or to the people. One question that is worth asking is why the United States bothered having a written constitution at all? We came from the United Kingdom, from Great Britain, and there they have a constitution of sorts, but it's not written. It's based on common law, based on a sequence of rulings by various judges and justices that create a tradition, a traditional set of expectations that people have of their government and about their rights or places in society. We didn't go that route. Why not? Why did we bother putting this in pen and ink on paper? Well, because the idea of the Constitution, again, is to restrain government activity. And if government has the freedom, if government has the freedom to decide what those limits on its authority are through judge decisions, for instance, then it can simply redefine those limits in whatever way suits its needs at a particular time. But once you set them in, so in stone, so to speak, once you put them on paper, you've got a legal document that says what it says and doesn't say what it doesn't say. So you've got a system of consistent rules that bind the government and are very difficult to change. And what this means is that, again, just because you've won an election doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. You might get elected to be the president by a majority vote, but that doesn't mean that you can start denying people their individual liberties. Just because 51% of the population said it's okay doesn't mean you can enslave the other 49%. Which leads us into our next principle, that of republicanism. Before I define republicanism, however, I want to quote Thomas Jefferson again to illustrate the importance of this rule of law principle in our Constitution. The greatest danger to American freedom is a government that ignores the Constitution. In other words, the reason that our government can be used to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity is that it is bound by the rules and principles and procedures detailed in the Constitution. The moment those rules are being ignored, we have no reason to believe that our government will not become tyrannical. Okay, so republicanism. Republicanism is the belief or principle that the republic is the only legitimate form of government. A republic, in turn, is a type of democracy in which citizens elect constitutionally limited representatives who govern on their own behalf. You can contrast this form of democracy, the republic, with, say, a direct democracy or a government that is initially elected but that doesn't have limits on the authority of those people who have assumed office. In a direct democracy, every time a government decision has to be made, every citizen gets together to vote on what that decision should be. So if you're in ancient Athens, for example, and you're about to be invaded by Sparta, you get together to vote, hey, should we defend ourselves, capitulate, or what? And once you've figured that out, now you've got to vote on how to defend yourself. Do you need a tax? Well, you've got to vote on whether to create a tax, and then you've got to vote on how high that tax should be. This works great 
and very small insular groups and student organizations, for instance, but in very large societies with hundreds of millions of people like our modern nation state, it's impractical. Another form of democracy is a representative democracy. The people get together, they vote on who will represent them, and then that person, by virtue of having won an election, can do whatever they want. But remember, the rule of law principle tells us that even if you win an election, there are still limits on what you can do with your power. And again, that's something that people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the French revolutionaries might not fully agree with in their doctrine of popular sovereignty. But it is an important piece of the American constitutional system. What we're going to find, for instance, if you listen to the words of James Madison, is that the purpose of the Constitution is to restrict the majority's ability to harm the minority, which it does by protecting individual liberties from government incursion. So once more, just because you've got two people in a group of three to vote that you should kill the third doesn't authorize you to do so. Thomas Jefferson similarly said that the Republic is the only form of government which is not eternally at open or secret war with the rights of mankind. Why? Because in a republic, you have to have the rule of law. And the rule of law tells you that you're not allowed to violate certain inalienable freedoms or rights held by individuals, even if you won an election. All right. The next major principle we're going to talk about is federalism. And I don't want to dwell too long on federalism because we've got an entire week of lecture dedicated to this principle next week. But federalism is the principle that power should be shared and divided across multiple different levels of government. Remember that in the British Empire, basically all lawmaking authority was concentrated into the hands of the centralized government, the crown and parliament. And that wasn't very responsive to our localized wants, needs, and interests. So when we declared independence, we created the Articles of Confederation, and we went to the opposite extreme. Basically, all lawmaking authority in the Articles government was vested in the individual states, and the federal government wasn't strong enough, many argued, to maintain law and order after the war was over. So we didn't like that either. Therefore, in the Constitution, we took the best of both worlds. We shared and divided power across both the national central government of the country as a whole and the local state governments of individual states on a state-by-state -state basis. So that's federalism. And the quote that I have for this is from James Madison in Federalist 45, where we find that the powers delegated by the proposed constitution, our constitution, to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in state governments are numerous and indefinite. So again, there are powers held by the federal government, however limited they might be, and then there are powers handled by the states, however broad they might be. But they are shared across both levels. Next, we get the separation of powers, which shouldn't be confused with federalism. The separation of powers principle is the principle that the three fundamental functions of government, legislating, administrating, and adjudicating, should be spread across different branches of government so that no one portion of the government can ever become too powerful. Again, I'm going to quote James Madison, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, are in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or of many, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Who is the of many in this equation? Well, that would be the people at large, the masses. So again, we're not a direct democracy. We are a type of democracy, but in particular, we are a republic. And we don't ever want the people who are making the laws to also be able to execute and enforce the laws or resolve disputes about the laws. Because if, for instance, Congress were to create a law that we, the people, felt violated the Constitution or our freedoms under the Constitution, which, by the way, is a source of law, then we want a independent judiciary to resolve that dispute. We say, hey, Congress, you violated my constitutional freedom of speech. And we go to a third party who can help resolve whether, in fact, Congress had. But if Congress has both the power to make the laws and resolve disputes about the laws, then if we felt that they had violated the Constitution, we would take that dispute to Congress. And they would, of course, always rule in their own favor. And therefore, we would have no way to check them. Which is a great segue into principle number six, checks and balances. Checks and balances is the principle that government should be organized according to a system 
which allows each branch of government to limit the powers or curb the influence of the other branches, so as to prevent any one branch from exerting too much power. In other words, it is the idea that when we are separating or dividing powers across multiple branches of government, we should do so in a way that creates checks and balances, in such a way that each branch has some way to amend or veto the acts of any other branch. For instance, if Congress were to try to create a law that gave itself the power to mediate disputes about the law, in other words, to adjudicate, the judicial branch could rule that unconstitutional. If Congress created a law that the president really didn't like, well, he could veto it. So each branch has some way to keep the others under control. And there's a really, really famous quote about this from James Madison that you should have read this week. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. So again, that's a quote from James Madison talking about the importance of checks and balances. You cannot have checks and balances unless you first have separated powers. But once you've separated the powers, you also need to give each branch of government the ability to make sure that no other branch ever begins abusing its authority or trying to take on new duties outside of its appropriate domain. So it is worth noting that as frustrating as the gridlock we see in government can be, it's also an intentional design built directly into the Constitution. The three branches of government are not meant to cooperate or work together. They're meant to be adversarial so that each one actively limits the influence of the others so that no one branch ever has too much power or influence over our individual lives and we each remain our own masters in day-to-day -day matters. Okay, so that's checks and balances. Finally, we've got limited government, and this is a big one. The principle of limited government is the principle that political powers should be used only for a small number of specifically, divine, uh, specifically defined purposes or goods, and that both the government's size and its overall level of activity should be limited to what is absolutely necessary for the fulfillment of these core functions or the realization of these limited goods. In other words, the principle of limited government tells us that the government is only allowed to exercise power towards the specifically delegated and designated ends defined by our Constitution. And it is only able to pursue these particular goals in ways authorized by the Constitution. If the Constitution does not tell Congress that it can do something, it should be interpreted as telling us that Congress is not allowed to do that thing. So here are some quotes to help drive this home. The first one is also going to be from James Madison, and it reads, It will be of little avail to the people that laws are made by men of their own choice, i.e. that we have elections, if the laws become so voluminous that they cannot be read, or so incoherent that they cannot be understood if they be repealed or revised before they are promulgated or undergo such incessant change that no man who knows what the law is today can guess what it will be tomorrow. In other words, we want to limit government's lawmaking activity because if the government's making too many laws, it becomes very difficult for we, the people, to decide which of these laws are in our best interest and which ones are doing more harm than good so that we can reward elected officials who create laws from which we benefit and punish those who create laws that hurt us. We need to limit the government's overall level of activity. Thomas Jefferson tells us that the care of human life and happiness, not their destruction, is the first and only objective of good government. So again, governments should be limited to the protection of human life and happiness. Everything the government does needs to be working towards these goals. Thomas Jefferson also told us that most bad government has grown from too much government. 
If the government becomes so large, if there are so many different individuals making so many different decisions that we, the people, can no longer keep track of those decisions, again, it becomes impossible for us to hold leaders accountable. If there are so many people making decisions that we don't know which individual leaders have made bad decisions and which ones made good decisions, we can't continue to reelect the good leaders and punish or kick out of office the bad leaders. So government must be limited in its overall level of activity and its overall size, in its power and the goals that it uses that power to achieve. And the number one way we know from prior lecture to limit government activity is by protecting individual freedoms or liberties. Individual liberties are a type of natural right that protect individuals from government incursions against their fundamental freedoms by prohibiting certain actors in power from taking those freedoms away. So in other words, an individual liberty is a freedom the government is not allowed to violate. It is a rule or prohibition on government action telling the government there are certain things that you are entitled to enjoy which it should not interfere with. As Patrick Henry once said, if is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Thomas Jefferson said there is no justification for taking away individuals' freedoms in the guise of public safety. In other words, what they're telling us is that if an individual has a freedom, the government must respect that freedom. Therefore, when I tell you that you have a freedom of speech, I am limiting the government by creating a rule on what it is not allowed to do. Your freedom of speech tells the government that it is not allowed to censor you. Your freedom of religion prohibits the government from ever engaging in an activity that would force you to practice a particular faith or abandon your own beliefs. These individual liberties then are going to work together as a system of limitations on government authority. And this is an American tradition that goes all the way back to the Massachusetts body of liberties that we discussed previously and even further back than that. So these are the seven core principles of the Constitution. Now, just so there's not confusion, I want to talk a little bit about this term, the Madisonian model of government or Madisonian government. Because sometimes when you ask people about the core principles of the Constitution, instead of saying that five and six are the separation of powers and checks and balances, respectively, they will merge these together. And they will say that the fifth of six core principles is the Madisonian model of government. So what you need to understand is that the Madisonian model of government is basically just government, which has first separation of powers and second checks and balances. And the reason that we call this the Madisonian model of government is that, A, it's very, very strongly embedded into the main body of the Constitution, which was very greatly influenced by James Madison, and B, because at the Constitutional Convention, James Madison was one of the most vociferous advocates for these two principles and their inclusion in our national charter. All right, now that we've looked at the seven core principles of the Constitution, let's look at its core components. Remember, the core components of the Constitution are the preamble, the articles, and the amendments. The preamble is that opening paragraph of the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution. The Articles of the Constitution are the main body, which was drafted by the delegates at the Constitutional Convention. And the amendments are a sequence of changes that have been made to the Constitution over time. There are 27 amendments in total. But you can take the articles and the amendments, and you can sort them into categories. So, for instance, the articles, the seven articles that comprise the main body of the Constitution, can be divided into the first three, which describe the three branches of government, four through six, and then seven. And we'll talk about the differences between these momentarily. But before we dive into the articles or the amendments, let's start at the very beginning of the Constitution by looking at the preamble. Now, I've already recited the preamble's text to you, but you're going to notice that I've bolded and I have underlined some of that text on your screen. So, I have bolded the words, we the people of the United States. 
This again is where we find that the Constitution is a social contract, that it derives its authority from the consent of the governed. The Articles of Confederation did not say, we the people of the United States, they said, we the delegates of the states. In other words, the Articles of Confederation created a government that was not by and for the people, but by and for the states. Now, the states themselves were sort of miniature republics. The people in those states had voices, uh, but the federal government was not really meant to be a representation or an extension of the people. It was meant to be a structure to help coordinate the war effort among the states. That changes with the very first words of the Constitution. We the people. This is a social contract. This is government by and for the people. We the people hold the power and we're going to use that power to ordain and establish this Constitution. If we didn't, it would have no authority and would not be binding to us. So that's the bolded opening clause and it's quite a deep, a pregnant, a profound clause, but this little paragraph also identifies the six limited goods that government is meant to provide to the people. So the underlined terms, form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, are each going to identify some function, some good or service that government is meant to pursue. And remember that principle of limited government. It tells us that there are certain goals that the government is allowed to pursue and certain goals that it ought to leave to individuals. One thing you're going to notice that is never mentioned in this preamble and its list of legitimate government ends is securing the salvation of those who have not yet accepted our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, depending on your personal beliefs and background, you might think that it is very important to evangelize, to teach people about Jesus Christ. But the preamble of the Constitution doesn't identify that as a part of the government's proper function. The government is not created to evangelize us. That's the church's job. If you are a Christian, it is your moral duty to help bring people to salvation, but it is not appropriate for the government to do that because it is outside of the constitutionally defined goals that governments exist to create. So these six underlined terms each represent one of the six constitutionally permissible goals that the government should pursue. In other words, everything the government does is supposed to be working towards one of these six goals. And if it's not working towards one of these six goals, it is not a legitimate or appropriate or constitutionally legal action for the government to take. Let's start with the first underlined term, to form a more perfect union. A more perfect union than what we had under the Articles of Confederation. Okay, that one's pretty straightforward and mainly historical. But the other five are transhistorical establish justice. Well, one proper function of government is to, again, provide us with justice if we've been wronged, if our rights have been violated. And in our country, that happens through the judicial branch when it adjudicates disputes about the law. So to establish justice is to create legal rules governing the conduct of individuals both in and under government and courts, independent courts which have the power to mediate disputes and disagreements about those rules. The second underlined term, oh, I'm sorry, the third underlined term is to ensure domestic tranquility. Well, the government is supposed to maintain law and order. We're not supposed to have people rioting in the streets. We're not supposed to have people storming the Capitol building. And when these things do happen, it is the government's job to step in so that we don't have dangerous chaos. This is a part of why the government is allowed to do things like prohibit you from shouting bomb on a crowded airplane or fire in a crowded movie theater. And it's a part of why you can't just amass a large group of people and block off a highway. The next underlined term is provide for the common defense. The Constitution does tell us that it is a part of the government's divine duty, or rather I should say its duty sanctioned by the consent of the governed to provide the common defense, or in other words, to protect us from foreign aggression. Promote the general welfare is the next term. And this one can be easily misunderstood because today when you use the word welfare, usually what we're talking about are entitlement programs. 
uh, that tell us individuals are entitled to a certain quality of life and that the government should provide that by giving them food stamps or sending them money. So, for example, during the COVID-19 epidemic, the government made the decision to send checks to individual people affected by that pandemic throughout the country. But here's the thing. While people might think of that as welfare today, that's not what the term general welfare referred to at the time that our Constitution was written, and it's not what would have been expected by the framers at that time either. At the time that the Constitution was written, the general welfare referred to national improvements, things that were generally beneficial. If you send me, Connor Alfred, a check for $600, that's definitely going to promote my private welfare, but it's not necessarily taking a direct step to promote the general welfare. Now, hopefully, I will take that money, I will inject it into the economy, and therefore, I will use the money to benefit the people around me. But that becomes my responsibility and not the government's. So again, when we are talking about promoting general welfare in this context, it was not originally thought to apply to things like social spending to help the poor and elderly. Instead, it was thought to apply to things like canals, railroads, and highways. Finally, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Government, remember, is an institution, and it's supposed to provide long-term stability. In this case, it is supposed to provide long-term stability in the protection of our liberties, so that I know that if I have a freedom of speech today, that same freedom will be there tomorrow and for my children and their grandchildren. So altogether, what we're going to see is that the preamble embodies the principles of the social contract and of limited government. It defines the proper functions of government, and it couches ultimate power in the hands of we the people. All right, let's move on to the articles of the Constitution. The articles of the Constitution are sometimes called the main body. And you can think of the articles as essentially the institutional blueprint or skeletal outline telling us what government looks like, how it will operate, what it can and what it cannot do in terms of its general operational procedures. The first three articles are going to define the three branches of government. Article 1 tells us that the legislative branch will be comprised of Congress, that the Congress will be divided into the House and the Senate, so on and so forth, and it will tell us what procedures that Congress must follow in order to create policies. Article 2 describes the executive branch, and in particular, it talks about the presidency. Now, when we get to the executive branch, we're going to discover that today it encompasses a lot more than what was originally envisioned through the federal bureaucracy. But by and large, Article 2 tells us that the executive branch is going to be centered on the president and the vice president, and that their job is to administrate and enforce the laws created by the legislator. Then finally, Article 3 tells us that the judicial branch will be comprised of a Supreme Court and any such lower courts as Congress shall create, and that its responsibility will be to adjudicate disputes about the law. Articles 4 through 6 are a little bit harder to group. They're a bit more motley, but essentially they're going to do these three things. Article 4 is going to discuss relations among states, and it's going to reassert state sovereignty. So in Article 4, Section 1, we get the recognition by each state of acts by other states. In other words, this is like the full faith and credit clause. This is telling us that if you get a license to drive in Texas and then you go into Oklahoma for the day, I can't try to arrest you and say that you were driving without a license because you didn't have an Oklahoma license. Uh, section 2 says that we're not going to discriminate against the citizens of other states. And Section 3 deals with the treatment of new states and territories, while Section 4 of Article 4 tells us what guarantees the states have from the federal government. We're not going to go into these in great detail, but the fifth amendment to the Constitution defines two distinct ways by which the Constitution can be changed, and we will briefly look at them momentarily. Then we get number six, and Article 6 does a couple of things. First, in Section 1, it tells us that we're good for our prior debts, that the United States, under the 
Constitution is going to pay back the money that we borrowed under the Articles of Confederation. Then, in Section 2, we get the Supremacy Clause, which establishes a hierarchy of laws in our country, and we'll discuss that further next week in our discussion of federalism. Finally, the sixth article of the Constitution deals with oaths of office. Then we get Article 7. And Article 7 is mostly important for historical purposes. It tells us that it will take 9 out of 13 of the original 13 states to ratify, and it includes what's called the Attestation Clause. If you're really curious about these, I would encourage you to use the optional resources, and in particular the interactive constitution that I have made available to you on Blackboard, because we don't have time to talk about them right now. But again, understand, for our purposes, Article 7 is mostly important in its historical relevance. Let's jump back to Article 5 for just a moment. Remember what I told you, there are two general ways by which the Constitution can be amended. On the one hand, it can be proposed by Congress. An amendment might be proposed by a two-thirds vote of both the House and Senate, and then it will have to be ratified by three-fourths of the states during separate ratifying conventions or ratified by three-fourths of the state legislators. In other words, either three-fourths of the state call conventions where their citizens get together and vote to ratify that amendment, or three-fourths of the state pass legislation saying that they as a state want to ratify it. That's route number one. And if you don't want that, there's another option. Another way that you can amend the Constitution of the United States is to have a convention of the states called by Congress on an application of two-thirds of the state legislators, after which point it must be ratified by three-fourths of the states in a ratifying convention or by three-fourths of the states through their legislators. So the real difference between these is how the amendment is formally proposed. That first step is the big difference. The three-fourths of states ratifying either through a convention where citizens vote or through their state legislators is pretty ubiquitous across both. What this means is that it's very, very, very difficult to amend the Constitution. And that's one thing I want you to understand. The Constitution is not meant to be easy to change for a couple of reasons. Number one, remember that idea that we should have a government limited by the rule of law. If it's really easy to change the Constitution, which gives us the rules for the rule makers, then any time the government wanted to do something to us or do something that is prohibited, it would simply alter the rules, allowing itself to cross new boundaries. It would move the goalpost as was convenient, and therefore the Constitution would not be useful any longer. The second reason is that, remember, the Constitution is supposed to be a general plan of government, a system of broad rules. It's not supposed to be changed or altered or amended as a way to address, to address every day-to-day -day decision. That should be done through the legislators of the states or of the federal Congress. And the Constitution should be left to more or less deal with the big picture issues, questions like who can make laws and under what procedures. All right, so those are the articles, and we are almost done. I know this lecture is going long, but now we're in the amendments. And remember, the amendments are a series of changes to the Constitution. There are going to be a number of different amendments that we could talk about, but I want to focus on two separate groups of amendments. First, the Bill of Rights, and second, the Civil War Amendments. The Bill of Rights are the first ten amendments to the United States Constitution. Now, it is worth noting that the Bill of Rights were written by James Madison, a Federalist, as a concession to the Anti-Federalists, who would not ratify the main body, the seven articles of the Constitution, unless the Federalists agreed to, in turn, ratify this Bill of Rights, creating limits on how that government would exercise its powers and securing individual freedoms, as well as the rights of states, in order to do so. But the original Bill of Rights drafted by James Madison included 12 proposed amendments. Two of them were rejected, the other 10 were passed, and those are, again, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution that we call the Bill of Rights today. 
The other two were unique. Uh, one, the first of the two rejected of the 12, stated that no particular Congress should be able to give itself a pay raise, i.e. that if Congress ever votes for a pay raise, it doesn't go into effect. That pay raise doesn't go into effect until after the next election. This was eventually ratified as the 27th Amendment in 1992 as a part of a project by a high school student. So if you ever feel like you don't have any power over the government, remember in the 1990s, not that long ago, a student in a high school was able to actually get a new rule added into the National Charter. The second of these 12 amendments that was rejected would have limited congressional districts to about 50,000 constituents apiece for the House of Representatives, but this was never ratified, and at this point, it probably never will be. So we get the 10 amendments that you see on your screen right now. Freedom of speech, religion, press, assembly, and petition in one. The right to bear arms in the second. Courting of soldiers is prohibited by the third. Unwarranted searches and seizures are prohibited by the fourth. We get the rights of persons accused of crime in the fifth. In the sixth, we get the rights of persons on trial for crimes. In the seventh amendment, we get jury trials in civil cases. The eighth limits bail and cruel and unusual punishment. The ninth tells us that there are certain freedoms that might not have been listed in the Constitution, but the failure to include them does not indicate that they do not exist and are not retained by the people. And the tenth tells us that any power not explicitly delegated to the federal government by the main body of the Constitution is reserved to the states unless it is explicitly prohibited to the states. So... The big picture here, the main thing I want you to understand about the Bill of Rights, other than that this is the first 10 amendments, is that it is in the Bill of Rights where we find most limits on government activity and most of our individual freedoms. There are only three constitutional liberties protected in the main body of the Constitution. And as a bit of homework, I'm going to encourage you to look those up because they are described in your book. And I'm not saying they'll be in this week's quiz, but they could be. The Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments, and it secures our individual liberties as a way to limit government. Then we get the Civil War Amendments, 13, 14, and 15. These are called the Civil War Amendments because each of them was passed more or less immediately after the Civil War, America's sort of second founding, and each of them is dealing with a problem that became evident or paramount in national discourse after that conflict. So for instance, the 13th Amendment, abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment redefined citizenship to encompass and include former slaves and their descendants, and it prohibited states from denying equal protection of the law on the basis of your race, or rather, more precisely, on the basis of your status as a former slave or the descendant of a former slave. And then finally, we get the 15th Amendment. Sometimes people tell you the 15th Amendment gave African Americans the right to vote. Not technically correct. Technically, there's nothing in the Constitution that says anyone has a right to vote. Instead, what the 15th Amendment tells us is that you cannot have racially discriminatory policies on who is eligible to vote. In other words, a state could say, we're not going to have an election to decide who our governor is going to be. We're going to do that by a lottery. But under the 15th Amendment, it could not say we will have elections, but only white people are allowed to vote. So the 15th Amendment does not create or give anyone the right to vote, in theory. In practice, however, it does extend suffrage to the former slaves and their descendants by prohibiting racial discrimination and voting laws. And that is our super synopsized crash course in the American Constitution. I hope you have found this as fascinating as I do, and I look forward to seeing you next week.